time. But we know him from a long time. We know him how long ago now? Early 90s. In the mid 80s. Uh, so 86, late 80s, late 80s, late 80s, late 80s. Late 80s. Yes. When I was still on the elementary, I think, late elementary. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we're happy to have Abuna show with us. We enjoyed, I think, everybody last yesterday enjoyed his talk, and uh, we are looking forward for the blessing of uh, this Bible study on the Book of Job. Thank you, Abuna, Thank for you. coming. We all have uh, our Bibles um, because it's a, this is a Bible study. Uh, we really need to dig uh, deep into the Word of God, uh, need to see it, need to go through it and read it. Uh, it's not a detailed verse by verse for all of the, the three chapters of Joel, but we will stop at some key verses and key passages as well. So the way this Bible study will go, God willing, is um, we'll have an overview uh, about the book of Joel. And as we're doing that, uh, we're going to stop at some areas and go a little bit deeper. Uh, and my prayer, and I hope you can join me in praying for this, that as we open the word of God, that God opens our own eyes so that we can really see uh, wonderful and wondrous things from his word and from his statutes and commandments. Beautiful, beautiful uh, book, the book of Joel. Um, so <clears throat> I'm reading from the NIV. I'm not sure which version you have. You might have the New King James or you might have the Old King James. Um, I, I'm going to read, if you don't mind. Uh, and if you could follow um, as I'm reading, I'll read all the three chapters all together. And then we will start the presentation, uh, the overview, and stop at key points. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is, as you're reading, and this, is, this might be your first reading of the book of Joel, at least today, or you may have read it before, or you may have read it two, three times. Uh, I'd like you to have a, a, maybe a pencil, and if you're using uh, an electronic device, um, just jot down the verse or maybe highlight it, or if you have a, a way to put notes, if there's something that catches your attention, or something that uh, gets highlighted for you, I want you to note that as we're reading. Okay? So let us begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The word of God from Joel the prophet. May his blessings be with us all, amen. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel, Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It had stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley. 
because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withered from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day. For the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before, your, before our very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seeds are shri shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down, for the grain has dried up. How the cattle moan. The herds will mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the open pastures, and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains. A large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them fire devours, behind them a flame blazes. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them a desert waste, nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses, they gallop along like cavalry, with a noise like that of chariots that leap over the mountain tops, like a crackling fire consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish, Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swivering from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through the fences without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into the houses like thieves. They enter through the windows. Before them, the earth shakes. The sky trembles. The sun and moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of His army. His horses are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey His command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments, Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn. A byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord will be jealous for his land and take pity on his people. The Lord will reply to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern army far from you, pushing it into, the, into a parched and barren land, with its front columns going into the eastern sea and those in the rear into the western sea, and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Be not afraid, O land, be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid, O wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the wine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. 
Rejoice in the Lord your God, for He has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and, and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, great, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will, will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine that they might drink. Now what have you against me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all your regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me for something I have done? If you are paying me back, I will swiftly and speedily return on your own heads what you have done. For you took my silver and my gold and carried off my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, that you might send them far from their homeland. See, I am going to rouse them out of the places to which you sold them. And I will return on your own heads what you have done. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the, to the Sabaean, to the Sabians, a nation far away. The Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors that all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your, pl your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the wickling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tremble the, tremp, tremple the grapes, for the winepress is full, and the vats overflow, so great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for His people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house, and, with, and, with, and will water the valley of Acacias, but Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem through all generations. Their blood, guilt, which I have not pardoned, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. Glory to the Holy Trinity. It's a uh, It's very nice to read a whole book together. That these books were meant to be read like that. You know, when you uh, when you think about letters <clears throat> that were sent, for example, uh, to the Philippians and so on, they weren't meant to be read one passage at a time. 
they were meant to be read in, in complete format because then you get um, the general sense of what the book or the letter um, is saying. So let's have a look at uh, Joel. First of all, the word Joel or, or Yuil, Joel, Joel, uh, Joel means, as you can see, Yahweh is God. And the prophets, um, it's quite interesting. Prophets are related, their names are related to their message. So keep that in mind as we study Joel. Yahweh is God. The interesting thing uh, about this is the first verse. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Uh, the word Pethuel is a Hebrew word and it means Yahweh opens. So the father of Joel means Yahweh opens and Joel means Yahweh is God. If you put them together, it's as if there is a message for the people of Israel and for us in order to see that Yahweh is God, that Jehovah is God, you have first to, to get Yahweh to open your eyes. So the, the father here is Jehovah opens. No one can really say, um, I know God. No one can really claim to believe in, in Christ unless God opens his or her eyes. So we don't believe out of our own efforts, period. In fact, who opens our eyes to believe? It is God himself. And, and there's a lot of hope in that because if it was left up to us, we probably don't see, won't see a thing. But God opens our eyes to see. If you look at the book, um, not, nothing much is known about the writer um, except that he's mentioned, his name is mentioned in his book and is mentioned in the book of Acts um, uh, in chapter 2. Also, we don't know... A, precisely when this book was written. And there are, as you can see on the screen, there are two thoughts. There are people who believe <clears throat> it was written uh, before the exile of the Israelites, and others believe it was after the exile. Uh, before the exile, the date goes back to 800, 850 before Christ, BC. Uh, and the date after the exile is in about the 400s BC. And, and so th those who believe it was the, before the Babylonian captivity, they, uh, they say the following. Say, first of all, you could see here in, in, in the book that though Jerusalem is mentioned several times, there is no hint of it having, 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 having been previously destroyed and rebuilt. So there's nothing mentioned there about it being destroyed and rebuilt. And, and scholars believe this is an important matter. Maybe it would have been mentioned if that was the case. Uh, also, the mention of the northern army seems to point to, the, to Assyria and or Babylon as a present threat. Um, so something that is imminent but hasn't happened yet. And also there are several references to the temple. So if this was after the exile, after the exile the temple was destroyed. There was no temple. Um, and there are several references to the temple. So those are the believers or the, the scholars who believe that this was written before the exile. However, the argument for post-exile also exists. And again, uh, here you find that Joel speaks of Israel having been scattered among the nations. So there is a reference here to a possibility of the exile or the Jews being all over the place. He makes reference to the inhabitants of Judah having been sold to the sons of Javan, the Greeks which is something that is post-exilic time. Edom is described as having done violence to the son of Judah in chapter 3, and there is mention, no mention is made of any king, uh, which again, and pr the priests and the elders were mainly the heads of Israel at the time. So there is the argument here and there, uh, there really the, the exact date isn't, uh, isn't very well known. Other things that we observe is Joel makes no mention of the northern kingdom of Israel as a separate entity. Um, so that's, that's another thing. So we know that he's speaking to Judah and he's talking to Jerusalem, but he doesn't really mention the northern kingdom at all. And when he does speak of Israel, he actually is using it in the sense to refer to the people of God. 
all of Israel, not necessarily the northern kingdom or versus Judah, which is the southern kingdom. If you look at the outline, there are three chapters, very simple. Uh, first, in chapter 1, verse 1, it opens up with the imagery of locusts. You've, you've probably uh, seen locusts maybe on TV. Uh, you know, when they come in, they, they, they come in in numbers. If they do come in in numbers, it's, the, it's a disaster. So that's how he begins this, the story. It's a story of desolation. That's how the book starts. It begins with desolation and ends with restoration. So the beginning of the book uh, is really very gloomy, but the end of the book ends with a lot of hope and a lot of joy and a lot of restoration. In chapter 2, uh, there is the Lord's army. Most scholars believe that at the time of Joel, there was actually an attack by locusts. And he used that to describe um, God's judgment and he used that to describe the coming day of the Lord. And there are two coming days. There's the coming day that St. Peter speaks about in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and he quoted from Joel. From Joel. And then there is the coming day of the Lord, which is the second coming. Then you get into chapter 2, key verse. Chapter 2, verse 12. That's a key verse. You can highlight and say that's a key verse. It's a call to repentance. Um, all the prophets who've come and have prophesied, they prophesied saying, be careful you're going wrong. Make sure you repent. If you repent, God will forgive. It's a consistent message. So after chapter 2, verse 12, you begin uh, in verse 28. speaks about the Spirit of God. The Lord's Spirit. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, starting there, begins of judgment. And then starting in verse 17, it's the promise. You can also divide the, the chapters. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 speaks of Judah. And chapter 2, verse 28, all the way to the end, it actually addresses the nations, the whole world. Chapter 1 and chapter 2, up to verse 12, speaks about the present time and something that is immediately happening, very imminent, about to happen. And then chapter 2, verse 28 speaks of a future event and then the ultimate uh, event happening, which is in the second coming, um, uh, the day of the Lord. So you can also say that chapter 1 and chapter 2 speaks about time before Christ, and chapter 2, verse 28 to the end speaks of a time after Christ. <clears throat> like I said, it begins with mourning over present desolation, but it ends in rejoicing over future deliverance. So let's look at Joel chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. It says, Hear this, O elders. So look, look into, your, into the passage. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Why do you think it says, The word of the Lord that came to? W what do you think that means? Why is the, in other words, why is the prophet using this type of, this style? You're going to do the Bible study with me, right? What does it tell you when, when, when you open up the book and it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. What does that imply? It's not my word, right? The prophet isn't, it's not my word, so what? You're right. You're right about what you said. But so what? Sorry? Yeah, I can hear you and I can hear. Sorry. Be, be careful. This is an important message coming from God. That's okay. Okay. There is, an, uh, there is a message that's coming and it's appropriate at a certain time, specifically for certain people. God chose him, so what? So if God chose him, what does that give Joel? Hmm? A little bit of authority. This is a prophetic authority. If you're listening to these words, don't think they're my words. I have something called an authority, an authoritative, uh, author an authority for prophecy. These are not my words. Therefore, you better listen to them. It's like St. Paul when he said, I am a herald. You know what a herald, what a herald does? A herald works for the king. 
What does the Herald, back in the day, they didn't have internet and email to send messages. They would actually send a messenger. And if the messenger is the Herald from the king, all the people gather in the city square to do what? You gotta listen, because this message isn't the message of the person who's coming, but it is the message of the king. So right away, Joel begins by saying, what I'm about to tell you this is extremely important. And I have, I have this authority from God and this authenticity that these words are the words of God the Almighty, not my own words. So right there, he established what is known in the Bible as prophetic authority. This is, these are the words of God. And we talked about, first God opens our eyes so we can see Him as God. And then he says, hear this, you elders, in verse 2. Listen, all who live in the land. Um, he calls upon the elders first. But he does not keep his message for the elders alone. He says, first, hear you elders and listen all who live. This message is not for a certain group of people in the church. This is not, it's not a certain group of people in Israel. This is for everyone. But the elders have to hear first. Why? What do the elders do? They teach. They lead. They lead. If the elders don't listen, will the people listen? It's hard. So people look up to the elders. They look up to the leaders. Listen, all who live in the land. And then he tells them, you know, has anything like this ever happened? And has it ever happened to you or to your forefathers? And then he begins something uh, very nice. Uh, he tells them, you know, make sure you tell it to your children and make sure the children, they tell it to their own children. What is this called? Hmm? Taslim. Uh, what, what? So this, this is the passing on of the word of God. Um, tell it to your children. And then he speaks about four types of locusts in verse 4. Um, and in the New King James, it actually gives a different name. So first, the, gnaw, the, the gnawing locust, and then the swarming, and then the creeping, and then the stripping locust. Um, figuratively, this gives us an idea of the stages of sin. Uh, the, the, gnawing, uh, the gnawing locusts are baby locusts. So sin, when it starts to come into my life, it comes very small, like the gnawing uh, locusts. And then, if I allow that to come, what comes after? Um, the swarming ones. The swarming ones are the ones that crawl, the, 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 before crawling, so they're a little, little bigger. And then the creeping ones, and then when the, when the locust is fully grown, it actually ends up having wings, and it begins, um, it, it's a stripping locust or flying locust. And one of the fathers said, um, his, name, his name is Saint Mark the ascetic. He said, Satan offers us the small sins which appear to be insignificant in our own eyes. Because without that, he cannot lead us to the great sins. And this is a truth that I think all of us know very well. Uh, it is, the devil it, it doesn't come and say, oh, here is a big sin, do it. He first begins with something small that makes us uh, lose a connection with God and bit by bit, sin gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it destroys one's life. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. So here is giving also an imagery of the drunkards. Uh, again, this is an image of sin. Someone who is falling into a, a, a sin and has been falling into a sin for a long time, it makes that person semi-conscious, makes them not fully aware, like a drunkard. So he's calling those people to wake up and to weep. And then in verse 6 it says, A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. Is there anything that intrigues your attention out of that, in that verse? Hmm? Verse 6. A nation has invaded my land. So these are people who are uh, 
you know, far away from God. They have gone from stage one sin to stage four, uh, pretty terminal. You know, they're going to die. They're going to be destroyed. Sin has become like wine to them. It has made them completely unconscious or semi-conscious. They're not even interacting with God. Is there something in verse 6 that catches your attention? You can pick anything. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. He's talking about the locusts, and he's referring to it as nation, as a nation. So, yeah, the locusts were so numerous that they seemed like a nation. But also, it could refer to the nation of evil, or it could refer maybe to the northern a nation. It could refer to Babylon. Uh, what else? What else? Really, there's something here that caught my attention as I read it. Yes. A beast coming to devour. Yes, yes. But it's so interesting how first it began as a few locusts that are small. And then I said, no big deal. Just let them eat. And then these became uh, swarming and then creeping and then, and then flying. And all of a sudden it became a huge nation. There is a pronoun there that is very interesting. My nation. Despite the fact that this nation sinned, despite the fact that th these people have gone away from God, he still calls them my nation. Isn't that a message of, of hope for us? No matter what happens, no matter what the devil does, we are still God's. We're still his nation. You see that part where it says, invaded my land. This is my land. No one will take this from me. No one can snatch anyone from my hand, Jesus said. These are mine. Um, it has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. So he's looking at the locusts, and even though they're just locusts, but their teeth, like lions, and like fangs of lioness, they really devour uh, you know, uh, the agriculture, whatever there is there. Um, it has laid waste my vines and my fig trees and stripped off their bark and thrown it away. Uh, one of the fathers, he meditated about this teeth of the lions. He said, sometimes we are the teeth of the, of, of the lion. Um, sometimes we lend ourselves to the devil to use us to destroy other people. And, and, and I, I really like this meditation. It says, let's not be the weapon in Satan's hand against our brothers and sisters. But the reality is we do become like that. Um, sometimes we discourage people. Sometimes we put people down. Uh, sometimes uh, by talking about people, we're like the teeth of this lion, this, this beast. We look at the beast and say, the bad beast but we fail to recognize that sometimes we are his teeth and, and his mouth. Uh, mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Um, the husband of her youth. The husband here refers to God himself. We were betrothed to marry one, to marry God. We're his bride. But if we've left him and we've separated from him, he is the husband of our youth and we're grieving because he's no longer with us. We're no longer with him. Um, and then he speaks about, in verse 9, grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. Of course, when we are separated from God, when the relationship is gone, um, there is only outside rituals. There is no real relationship with God. And therefore, all the grain offerings and, and all the drink offerings, they're all cut off, cut, cut off from the house of the Lord. In verse 10, it says, The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. You notice here, grain, wine, and oil. This is very common in Old Testament prophecies. Grain, oil, and wine. And it, it symbolizes blessing. So the blessing is gone. When we're separate from God, there is no blessing. 
When we are far away from God, there is destruction and there is no joy. And after sin, there is despair. It says despair, you farmers. There's nothing. The vine is dried up, the, the palm tree and the apple tree and all the trees. Everything is dried up. And then he closes and says, surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Anything that brings joy is gone. Um, there is no specific mention uh, to that, to, spe to something specific that they were doing. This is just a, one of those cycles. Um, and if it was just before the Babylonian, then we, can, we have an idea when we go back to, uh, uh, second, uh, when we look, go back to the historical books, and we know what was happening at the time. But here he doesn't mention. He's looking at a destruction, something that is cu coming. And he clearly says, it's because you left the Lord. Because later on he says to them, return back to God. Return back to the Lord. Uh, sin in general is the same sin. Sin is sin. Sin is disobedience to God's commandments. What, and it takes on different shape and different forms. But later actually... Um, it speaks about the sins of other nations towards them. They've sold their, 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 their sons for, to, for prostitutes and, and so on and so forth. Um, I have a few words highlighted. Look at verse 2. What's the verb? Here. Look at verse 5. What's the verb? Wake up. Look at verse 8. Lament, mourn. Look at verse 11. Despair. What is it in the New King James? Be ashamed. Those four. First, a call to listen. How are we going to repent? If we don't listen, so the first step in repentance is to do what? Is to listen. And once we listen, we begin to wake up. Something inside of us begins to work. First we listen, and then there is awakening. Awakening, awareness of my sin. Why do people come to Christ? Have you ever asked this question? What does Christ, I'm sorry to, yeah, I need to put it in this marketing way, but what does Christ offer to the world? What does He offer to the world? Salvation. Of what? From what? From sin. Therefore, the first thing that will bring a person to Christ is to realize their sin and how bad it is. How stinky sin is. So if I don't realize I have a sin, I don't need a savior. Therefore, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit aims at what? At not realizing that I have a sin. Do you recognize this in, in, the, in the culture? Do you recognize the lack of awareness of sin? Oh, this is just a lifestyle. Oh, this is just a, no, well, this is the way we do it. It's not really wrong. If I don't recognize sin as sin, I will never, if I don't hear that this is sinful, I won't wake up. But if I do hear it and I do wake up, the first thing that's going to come upon me is what? The verb that you read in verse 8 is what? You begin to lament. You begin to mourn. Isn't that what St. Paul says in Romans 7 and 8? He says what? Oh, what a wretched man I am. How did he come to this point? When he realized that Sin is very sinful, and that which he wants to do, the opposite he does, and the good he wants to do, he ends up doing. He realized the impact of sin in him, and how destructive it is. Not just something we talk about in a sermon, oh, sin. No, no, no. This is a person who actually saw face to face what sin is like. It's as if you face the devil face to face. In horror movies, we close our eyes, we don't want to see what? 
I'm sure you don't watch horror movies, but if, if you do watch horror movies, you don't want to see the face of the devil. Well, you know what? Unless you realize how poisonous, how awful sin is, you won't wake up. And if you don't wake up, you won't lament. Let's me, let me put it in a positive way. If you hear it and you realize that you're going to wake up, and if you wake up and see this awful thing, it's like being diagnosed with cancer. I have, I, I didn't know, but now the doctor said, oh, oops, I have cancer. And then you begin to say, well, how do I get rid of this? And this first is mourning. And then the devil sometimes does what? Gets us to a point maybe where we can despair. Uh, you, you know when you sit down with your father of confession and you say, I feel so ashamed. What's the, in the New King James it said, be ashamed, right? Um, this is not a confession. To say I am ashamed is the end result of what? Of sin. Right? Sometimes we spend a lot of time in confession talking about the consequences. of sin. Shame is a consequence. To despair, despair your farmers. But then he begins in verse 13, the steps to repentance. Says what? I'm going to also refer you to verbs. Says verse 13, what's the verb? Gird yourself. Gird, yourself. Gird means what? Tamantak, uh, which refers to what? The, the strength and the will of the person. So here, there has to be a will to do what? To change. If you want to repent, there has to be a will to change. And then, um, verse 14 says what? Consecrate a fast. In other words, declare a fast. Declare a fast. And this, the fa fast, what is fasting? Fasting is language of the body. When you fast, when you change your meals, huh? Uh, we cannot deny the fact that it has to do, uh, a big chunk of it has to do with what? With the flesh. Okay, so the body here joins in with the spirit in repentance. There is a, there is a, there is a, a change that happens where first I put on sackcloth, per, first I gird myself, I'm willing, then I call for my body to come and join um, in this repentance. Summon the elders and all who live in the land. So, if you want to look at the steps of repentance, first, the will, supplication, holy grief, fasting, and then you call upon every part of you, every sense, every part of you has to be part of that repentance. No wonder sometimes our repentance isn't full because it is partial, it is not full, it, is not, it doesn't include the mind, it doesn't, it, it's missing one of, one of the elements. Okay, let's, let's move on to look at verse 15. What does the New King James says in verse 15? Can someone read it? You know? So, what does the, the word or the exclamation, alas, alas, uh, what does it tell you? It's here. What's here? For the day of the Lord, the judgment day of the Lord. And then verse 16 to 18, it simply shows how bad the destruction is. So he's setting up a sta the stage here for something. He's saying, finally, finally, everything is destroyed. The vine, the fig, the whole thing, everything is dried up. Here is the status of the human soul when sin corrupts. What are you thinking? If, if, this, if this was about you, and someone is telling you, this is destroyed, there is no hope in this, that everything is destroyed. Look, it says, no food, no joy, no gladness. The seeds are shriveled. The storehouses are ruined. The cattle moan. 
the herds mill about, everything is bad. What do you want to ask? God's mercy. I, I need God's mercy. So everything is bad. Is there, what else are you asking? You're asking for God's mercy, that's for sure. You're asking for forgiveness. You're asking, so everything is bad. Is there really hope? Is there something that can get me out of this? Or... Or are you simply painting out the picture that is very gloomy and very bad, period? And that's why he's setting up the stage to ask for a savior. If it's that bad, go back to Romans 7. If it's that awful, Romans 7 sets the stage for Romans 8. Romans 8 is very bubbly. It's very, uh, you know, if, if God is with us, who can be against us? Who will separate us from the... Romans 8 is different than Romans 7, right? And so he's setting up the stage here by saying, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. This is what sin has done. This is what sin has done. And you're saying, well, is there hope or are we done here? And he comes in verse 19 and says, to you, O Lord, I call. He sets the stage for the, for, to need a Savior. Remember what I said earlier, why Christ? Why Christ? If I don't realize how destructive sin is, why Christ? He came to save us. There is a Savior. There is a need for a Savior, an intercessor, someone who comes and restores. To you, O Lord, I call. There is no one who can help us out except God himself. I'm going to jump uh, to chapter 2. Verse 12, that's a key verse. You can highlight it and say key verse. Says what here? Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping and mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Quite interesting, we're studying this today and tomorrow the gospel is about the prodigal son. And what does the prodigal son do which is... Um, the best thing he's ever done is return. Return to me, declares the Lord. Return to me, and this is the return of every soul like the prodigal son. Why did he return? He realized how awful the life of sin looks like and how tormenting it was for him. With all your heart, this is the definition of repentance. You can put a, an uh, underline the word all, your heart. Because sometimes we come back to God, but not with all our heart. We come back with some of our heart. And the other part of our heart is still connected to that sin. So after a while, we go back to that sin again. Because we didn't leave the sin. We left it just with some part, but the other parts are still connected to it. There is no remaining place for sin in the heart of the one who repents. There is no remaining place. There, sin requires two things. You know what those two things are? In order to sin, you must have two, two things. What are they? You can, make, can write an equation. Blank plus blank equals sin. What are the two blanks? Excellent. Desire, she qualifies that as bad, plus opportunity equals sin. Opportunity, sometimes you may have control over that, of course, by not going to debauched places, by not going to places or, or hanging around the wrong type of people. But sometimes sin is all around us. It's on our phones. It's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. So sometimes it's good to cut the opportunity. But if the opportunity is not there, so I remove the opportunity, but the desire is there, what's the desire going to do? It's going to create the opportunity. Hmm? It's, and sometimes we look so miserable like that. 
God has removed the opportunity and yet because of our desire, we belittle ourselves, we look, we run after sin. We create the opportunity. But if I remove the desire and the opportunity comes, do you think sin will be fulfilled? Temptation, what's that? Yeah, You'd, you would remember this, you would know this. There are sins that we may have fallen into when we were young, right? But when we grew up, it's, we're not tempted anymore by these sins. Why? There's spiritual maturity. You know why? Imagine, um, I, I like this imagery a lot. People who fish, they go fishing. They put what in those hooks? Bait. If I throw, if I, in, um, amongst us here, I come in with gummy bears and I put them on a hook and I throw the gummy bears like this. Will you move? No, but if there are people in grade one and two, they'll move. But if I put $10,000 in that same hook and I go like this, at least the treasurer of the church will move. Right? Why? Everyone has a bait. Those are hooks. These hooks, if they don't find a receptor in me, it will go like this. Just like Jesus Christ on the mountain. The devil came to tempt him, and then he couldn't find a hook. He couldn't find a place to stay. He, he had, there's nothing in Jesus' heart that has an affinity to sin. So what does the, the bait do? What does the hook do? It just swings back. all your heart. Why do we fall in sin again? Because still we have something inside of us that belongs to the devil. That's why he finds his place to stay. But when we come back with all our heart, the devil comes and he finds no place in us. He cannot, he cannot overcome us. No wonder St. John says, those who are born of God do not sin. Really? But we're all sinners. Yes, 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 I understand. But those who are born of God, who day by day get rid of these what? Of these receptors. They do not sin. Sin is hard for them. <laughs> not the other way around. Sin is easy. No, sin is hard for them. Because there's no place. Because all the heart returned to God. With fasting and weeping and mourning, when I read the word weeping, I remembered the, the, the woman who came to Simon's house. And she started weeping at Jesus' feet. He said, cut and render your heart. Cut and render your heart, not your garments. Rend your heart means tear it. Tear your heart. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a heart surgery that needs to be done in us. It needs to be opened, cleaned, it needs to be open in supplication and in repentance uh, for us to come back. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate. Why would anyone come back to God? You know how we feel, oh, I just sinned, Abuna. I couldn't even stand up to pray. Do you hear this? Do you know this? Say, I couldn't face God in prayer because I, I'm a sinner. Uh, and you get this, this, this type of mentality that says, let me fix myself first before coming to church. Have you heard that mentality? Have you, ha have you come across that before? So I feel very ashamed. I can't come before God. You, you know, this, this to me, it's like, I am sick. Let me get better, then I'll go to the doctor. It's exactly what it, what it says. Um, why should I come back? What, what, what invites me to come back to God? Two things. His grace and His compassion. He says here, for He is gracious and compassionate. Can someone define, someone define grace for me? Can someone define mercy for me? Mercy first. What is mercy? Okay, that's mercy. That's what you define now is mercy, which is what? It's something that I don't deserve, but someone still gives it to me. 
Yeah, you, know, you know the the story of Napoleon and 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 the lady who came crying to him and said, "Please spare my son." He said, "But he's done something wrong, and he's done it so many times before." He said to him, "Please, please be merciful." He said to her, "But." How can I be merciful? He doesn't deserve it. He, and she said to him, if he deserves this, then it's not mercy. Mercy is something you give to someone when they don't deserve it. What is grace? Give a lot of it. Huh? When you say someone is gracious, it means there is abundance, of course. Mercy is when you, it's a gift that you get that you don't deserve. Grace is a gift that you get that you don't deserve and can never earn. No matter what you try to do, you can never earn it. It is freely given. So when we say that, that God, um, He saved us, saved us by grace, when St. Paul speaks of grace, it means that no matter what you could have done, you could not have saved yourself. Jesus needed to do what? Die on the cross. So why do we come back to God? Because of these two, these two things. He is inviting us. He said, come back to me. Well, Lord, we're afraid. We're very ashamed of our sin. We, we, we're very afraid. He said, come back to me. I am gracious, which means I'm going to gift you with, with, with forgiveness, something that you definitely don't deserve and cannot get unless I give it. Hmm? And why would you be gracious? Because I am compassionate. Because when I look at you, I have compassion towards you. I love you. For God so loved the world that He gave Himself, that He became, that his, He gave that grace to us for salvation. Um, <clears throat> so, that's in verse, verse 12. Um, I want you to go back to verse, 20, verse uh, 28. So chapter 2, verse 28. I want to show you something interesting in Bible study. Um, and this is common in Old Testament, in Old Testament prophecies. It's really nice. It's very neat. Verse 28 says what? And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I'll show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Verse 28 and 29. Do you notice something in the way they're written? Do you, do you notice something in the way they're written? Let me show you something very neat called... Uh, chiasmatic symmetry and it's used in the literature in the Old Testament to emphasize a message look at what what's on the board first it begins with something and it ends with it so in verse 28 and it will come about after this and verse 29 says in those days so you have days or time and time what's the next one I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and look at the bottom I will pour out my spirit. Third, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Third from the bottom. And even the male and female servants. And then the ones in the middle. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see vision, visions. This type, it's called chiasmatic symmetry. And it, it's used in the Old Testament literature to highlight the central verse. The central verse, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. And this is what St. Peter took in the book of Acts when he was referring to the pouring of the Holy Spirit and the change. It is, it, it is so beautiful how, yes, the Holy Spirit is inspiring the writers, but the writers are also using what? A style that at that time was very well known to highlight uh, a certain image. And so you'll find this is in, in, in Joel, but it's also found in Isaiah, it's found in Hosea, and, and you find this is called symmetry or chiasmatic symmetry. And Matthew, yes. Yes. And there's also in the New Testament called something called sandwiching. St. Mark was a sandwich maker. 
in his writing. That's not a bad thing, by the way. It's a very good thing. Where he gives you uh, the bun, then he gives you the meat, and then he gives you the bun. And he's paying, he's making you focus on the bun, on, like the meat inside, sorry, the meat inside. So uh, it's also used uh, to highlight details or illustrate an important information. And this here is about the coming of the Spirit of God and the change that will happen to men, uh, old men and young men. Um, can I refer you to, do I have five more minutes? Or are we done? Oh, 5.30. We have a few more minutes? Okay. Um, look at verse, chapter 1, verse 10. It says, the, the fields are ruined, the ground is dried up. What's the result? Three things are lost. The grain, the wine, and the oil. Do you see that? Chapter 1, verse 10. The grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. That's the stage of sin. Now, look up chapter 2, verse 19. The Lord will reply to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and oil. That which you have lost because of sin, I will do what? I will restore. And those triad are the triads of blessing in the Old Testament. And he will destroy the, the devil. He will destroy the devil and will completely annihilate his, his power. And you know that because he says in verse 20, at the end of verse 20, it says, and, and its stench will go up. What's a stench? It's a bad smell of something dead. It's a bad smell of something dead. Because the evil army, the locust, is dead. It's done. So we talked about this. So prophecy and fulfillment. Joel speak of God's spirit to be poured out. God's spirit was poured out. When? Acts chapter 2. He speaks of sons and daughters who prophesy, and men and women prophesied in the book of Acts. Prophesying, and you know what to prophesy means? It doesn't mean to tell the future. It means to preach and to teach, right? Dreams and visions, and dreams and visions were given. Blood and fire and vapor of, and smoke. Again, the reference here to the blood of Christ and the tongues of fire that came upon the disciples. Sun darkened and moon into blood, and the sun darkened truly at the time of crucifixion. Uh, the day of the Lord. It's a, it's a sentence or a verse that is repeated four, four or five times in the book of Joel, and it speaks of the destruction from the Almighty, and Joel and Isaiah speak of that. Cruel with furry and burning anger. Isaiah also talks about that. The day of the Lord's anger, Lamentation chapter 2 speaks about that. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and St. Peter speaks about that. So you see the connection here between the, how the Holy Spirit works through the different writers. And one of the beautiful things about the Bible, it's how unique it is. It's very, it has a unique message all throughout, from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, now let's move to the last part, which is chapter 3. Uh, starting from verse 1. In those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment. You know what the valley of Jehoshaphat uh, is? What's that? Jehovah judges, that's what it means, you're right. Uh, but do you know where that story is in the Old Testament? This is actually, he's referring here to something that actually happened. So if you go back, if you can open Second Chronicles, uh, chapter 20. It's a beautiful passage in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 11 to 30. So here Joel is saying pretty much, you know what? I'm going to make sure that the people who have done wrong... 
to the people of Israel, they get judged. Uh, and he refers to something that the Jews know very well, chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 11 to 30. Here, pretty much, <clears throat> the people of Israel are against an army that is coming from uh, Moab. If you look at the, this, they came from Ammon, and they joined with Moab, and they came to destroy, uh, to, to, to pick up a fight, pretty much a battle with the Israelites. So it says in verse 1, in chapter 20, 20 verse 1, after this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the, uh, of the Munites, came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Who's Jehoshaphat? He's the king. So the valley was called after that king. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea, and so on. Then in verse 5, Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem. And Joel is writing to Judah and Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat stood up before Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, here is someone who's going down on his knees, a king who's crying out, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you, O our God. Did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from, uh, from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So he's telling him, the people you told us not to destroy are now coming to destroy us. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us? By coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. You know that famous verse? We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Here is the image of the repentant, who knows the bitterness of sin. Not only the bitterness of sin, but the captivity of sin. And how it's like moving sand. It's sucking me down, and I'm not able to stand. I don't know what to do, Lord, but my eyes are upon you. I have no clue. But the only thing I know to do is to keep my eyes on you. What Joel said, alas, Destruction is here. And then he says, To you, O Lord, I call. What does God do? Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph. And he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to, to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And what does the Lord do? He destroys these people without Jehoshaphat doing a thing. All that Jehoshaphat had to do was to return to God, was to bow before him, was to say, I have no idea what to do except my eyes are upon you. Tell me. And God said, I will take care of them. So here in chapter 3, in Joel, He's referring to that valley of Yahweh who judges, who took care of Jehoshaphat and now will take care of the nations that have come upon Israel. And then the closing from verse 17, then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion. If the, if, if the chapter begins by, by showing us an image of what sin does, sin destroys. And sin and the devil 
they're not only going to be satisfied to destroy part of you. The devil wants to destroy all of you. And he's going to do it, and he is so patient. And he will send small sins to ruin some of you, some of what is in you. And then when that's done, he's going to send something bigger. Remember the four locusts, right? And then when that's done and you've allowed that, you've opened the, a door, you've opened the, a crack, then a window, then a door, then he's going to come in with flying locusts to completely destroy. And when you are at that stage, you look up and say, Lord, now, now I realize what sin can do, what sin has done. Now I realize what St. Paul has realized. And I turn to you and I say, Lord, I need to repent. He says, repent? Very good. First you need to hear. Then you need to wake up. Then you need to mourn. And then you need to act and not despair. You need to put on the gird, the will, and you need to supplicate and you need to join with the fasting, the body and the spirit and the soul together. And then you need to call upon and summon all the elders. The elders, your mind and the senses. You need to summon everything, every part of you. Because you cannot come back to God with some of your heart. You need to come back to God with all your heart. So there is no hook that can find a, re a receptor or a place to hook in you. And when you do that, all you got to do is return. I will take care of the battle. I will take care of the battle. And when I take care of the battle, this is going to happen. Verse 17 is going to happen. Which is what? Then, then, you, will, then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion. My holy hill, Jerusalem, will be holy. The point here is, when the Lord dwells in you, you become holy. I will dwell in Jerusalem, therefore Jerusalem will be holy. Lest you think you're holy because of you. You're only beautiful because somebody so beautiful is in you. You're only holy because Christ is in you. So when He is in you, you are holy. The the, the book begins with the word of the Lord and the book ends with the Lord who dwells in Zion. The word of the Lord, the prophecy, the teaching. First, it's, it's like the Old Testament and the New Testament. At the beginning, God spoke to us through the prophets. But in the New Testament, He doesn't speak through the prophets. He comes and dwells in Zion. You see that? Always look at what the book starts with and what it ends with. It's quite interesting how that is. At the beginning, it's the word of God that comes to the prophets. But at the end, Joel is saying, um, God himself will dwell in you. Same message in Hebrews. First, God spoke to us through the prophets. But in the last days, he appeared himself in, 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 as Jesus Christ. And he dwelt amongst us. This is just pieces from the book. Obviously, there is a lot more that you can look into yourself. Um, but I want to close with what I started with. I said to you that the name of the prophet is related to his message. So refer to verse 27 in chapter 2. Why does God allow tribulations to happen? Why does He allow what we call bad stuff to happen to us? Why did He allow the locusts to come? First, He speaks of them as the locusts. But then in chapter 2, verse 25, He says, My great army. Nothing happens without the Lord's uh, 
permission. So these locusts, they were brought upon Israel so that they can wake up from, from what sin is doing. But then verse 27 says, Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God. So the whole point of this calamity is that the people may know Joel. Joel means what? I am the Lord your God. Yahweh is God. So that's where his name is related to his message. And God sends someone whose name, to us, we don't know what Joel means. It's what in, for example, in other words like Arabic names, we know what they mean. You know, you know when you say, uh, what's a, Adil, just, justice or just, uh, and so on. So that you may know that God is Adil. Huh? Huh? And I am Adel who's telling you the message. So Joel here tells them in verse 27, all this is going to happen that you may know that the, the, that the God of Israel is in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and that there is no other. Never again will my people be ashamed. And so maybe here it refers to the fact that they may have sought after other gods. And so he's referring here to, 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 to tell them there is no other God but me. Um, do you have any comments or anything that you want to highlight from your reading? I have this question. Is, is repentance incremental or complete? You should go and have a complete repentance or is it something that it's a process that you grow in it? Uh, very good question. Uh, is repentance incremental? Does it happen on stages? Or does it happen when you say complete, do you mean like all of a sudden? Like as a, as a one step thing change? It, sh it should reach that. It should reach that. Okay. It, it could, uh, I, would, I want you to elaborate on both. Yes, so uh, um, it, when it's not a complete repentance, I struggle and strive to make it complete, so I don't stop. So uh, repentance, uh, as you know the word metanya, huh, means a change of mind. And also, because my mind changed, there's a change in direction. Okay? So when I change direction completely, I no longer go back to that sin. But sometimes in the process of doing this, that's what I think you're referring to as incremental. You see that? Like I'm changing. I'm changing. I'm changing. I'm changing. I'm changing. Then it is a complete repentance. When I'm... When it's not a complete repentance, it doesn't mean that I should not, it doesn't mean I, I, I'm satisfied with that. Of course not, because an incomplete repentance will always bring about what I spoke about. You know, we go back to the sin. We go back to the sin. But because we live in this world and we struggle against the flesh, a lot of our repentances are like this. And so the important, the important thing is what? is that the direction is what is changing, right? But if the direction isn't changing, then there is no repentance whatsoever, there is no change. Sometimes I, the, the, the repentance isn't complete and isn't full because there is still the love of that in my heart or because it has become a habit and so you could hate the sin very much. You could hate it. But there's something called a habit. Which is your, your mind has learned. Your brain has learned. So this, sometimes some of these things, so like for example, a, an addiction. Someone could be really not wanting, the, their will is completely against that, but there is another element that's playing a role. So it's incremental until it is complete 
But complete repentance is what we strive towards. It came to my mind, uh, the story of uh, St. Moses, the black, was his uh, repentance complete or it was incremental? I, I just wanted to, from the story, it seems that it was complete because he, 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 tell, he, to, he told all the sins that he did and an uh, angel came and, and everything is wiped. But right. is, is this a realistic for most of people or is it something that we struggle every day all day? I'll tell you what I understand about um, uh, St. Moses and my fathers can correct me or can uh, uh, add more. From the sins he used to fall into, he completely repented when he knew Christ. So no longer will he stop people and kill them, no longer will he steal, no wrong. but uh, fighting against himself and against thoughts, we know that he was struggling with, with, with sins of his past. The story tells us seven times in one night, and every time, 11 times, and he would go back to his father. And he would go back. So you see this thing. But from the sins that he used to commit, yes, there was a complete change from the moment he knew Christ. So he didn't stop a couple of people and passed three. No, there was a complete change in that. But the struggle against sin was always an ongoing thing for him. Uh, I prefer to put it that way instead of being incremental or complete it's better to put it it's a journey that starts from the day of baptism and ends at the last moment of life it's more of a journey it's more of a process a continuous process of that change of mind and I think the better thing we do is to detach sin from repentance. What I mean here, we always, or on many cases, we put repentance on the context of stopping a certain sin. But we see repentance in a broader sense and a broader uh, way, which is we are changing to the fullness of the, the, the image of God. So it's, it's a process that cannot end until the end of life. And we reach its fullness in, in eternity. When we reach that image, when we see him, and we, we regain that image fully. And that process is sanctification. Sanctification from, when I heard Abuna say, from the point of baptism until we leave, that's the Holy Spirit doing what? Sanctifying us. That's why we see repentance as the second baptism, which is, it's the first baptism, it happened once, it cannot be repeated. The other is a process for whole life. Dying, I mean, for sin, we are dying and for sin, and, and then we live a new life. It's a process we should be living on, on every day, every moment. Okay, I just had uh, to stop and meditate a little bit on verse 11, chapter 1. Because we, this uh, meeting should be like servant uh, retreat or servants gathering. So from a mind of a servant, when I read this, ser uh, this verse, Be ashamed, you farmers, will you bind dressers? And they thought, even the servants, if as an individual servant, I may not be able to reach a weeping and wailing for my own sin. How, as a servant, I will reach the level even to weep, as the, the farmers and vine dressers are workers in the field, and they wait and weep for the harvest. There is no harvest or food coming. So as a servant, to be a servant, to wail and weep for the harvest, how can I reach this level? It's really touching me here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can, uh, I would suggest you read Joel on your own. 
Tonight would be good, today would be good. If you can go back and read again all the three chapters, maybe with some of the comments you've heard today. And, uh, and again, the, 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 the key point message of Joel is to return to God. Chapter 2, verse 12. 2, 12 is the key verse. Return to me, return to me. That's the key verse. Uh, it's, a, it's a call for repentance. And Abuna was telling me that this is, uh, that you chose this particular book because it speaks about the fasting and the fasting really is, is a discipline, spiritual discipline, that should aim at helping us repent. That's why we fast. And as we repent, we come closer to God. We return back to God. What a great opportunity during the Great Lent that we heed to that message. Um, uh, even now declares the Lord, even now in the Great Lent, it declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. So... Um, may, may God uh, really help us to um, come back to him with all our hearts. Glory be to God forever and ever. Thank you.